Let me just begin this morning by telling you that the book of Amos is a hard message. And if you've taken time to to read through the book of Amos, then you kind of saw that as well. I would tell you, if you go to most church websites and look through their sermons, you're going to be hard pressed to find a church that's doing a series on the book of Amos. And there's a pretty significant reason why, because it's not a happy book. And people want happy messages and they want to know, hey, how do I have a better work office relationship with the people I work with? How do I how do I do better at parenting and all those kinds of things? Those are the kind of messages that that people want. But as I said last week, the Bible is much more than just the New Testament and the book of Psalms. And there's a reason that the church needs Amos, because Amos tells us something about God That we need not forget. And that is that he is a God who always has the last word. Everybody likes to have the last word. When I went to Europe this last November, we visited many sites in London that were uh, concerning Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill was a man of great wit. He was famous for comebacks. One particular time he was at a party. And a woman named Lady Astor, who he had a very poor relationship with, said to him at the party, Winston, if you were my husband, I would put arsenic in your tea. To which Churchill responded, Madam, if I were your husband, I would drink it. (laughs) Everybody likes to have the last word. But the real last word always belongs to God. And, And Amos declared that God was ready to write the final chapter of the history of the northern kingdom. And the title of his first sermon was Four is Enough. Eight times Amos is going to quote the Lord saying, For three sins, even for four. And that is a Hebrew way of saying, This is the last straw. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back. (coughs) And he starts his sermon to Israel by preaching about the nations that are around Israel. Now remember, he's not preaching to all of those nations. He's preaching to Israel about those nations. So let's look at the first six messages together. They all start the exact same way. Amos chapter 1 verse 3. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four I will not turn back my wrath because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. And then in verse six, this is what the Lord says for three sins of Gaza, even for four. I will not turn back my wrath because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. And then in verse 9, this is what the Lord says, For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding the treaty of brotherhood. And then in verse 11, this is what the Lord says, For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion, because his anger raged continually, and his fury flamed unchecked. And then in verse 13, this is what the Lord says, For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because the, he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because he burned as if to lime the bones of Edom's kings. I can remember as a kid going to church with my grandma and the church that I grew up in would have what they would call these week long revivals. Any of you remember week long revivals or week long gospel meetings? Okay. well, what Amos is doing is he is preaching a week 
long revival meeting. And imagine how well these first six nights of this revival meeting are going. He is up in the northern kingdom and he is blasting Edom and Tyre and Syria. And he's blasting all of these nations that are around Israel, and they're just sitting there listening to this, people that they have had bad relationships with for centuries, and you get a lot of amens from the people. This is great, Jim. You're a godly Christian man. (laughs) Thank you very much. So he's preaching to to the northern kingdom about all of these nations around Israel and all of them are going, yeah, blast them, man. Tell it. Yes, we've been saying this for a long time. Tyre, yeah, we agree with you wholeheartedly. But I want you to notice something. In none of the judgments that he gives about these nations, God never condemns those nations for how they treat Israel. And this is even more interesting In none of those judgments did God condemn them for their false worship or their disgusting religious practices. So it raises really what I think is a very fair question. By what standard does God hold pagan nations accountable? And when you read the book of Amos, this is what you realize. These These nations are being condemned not for how they worship, not for how they treat Israel, but for violating the obligations to fellow human beings, particularly the powerless. All six of those nations that we went through were condemned for the way they treated the poor, the pregnant, even, frankly, the dead, the way they were wicked to their fellow man. Psalm 9, I read this at the very beginning of the service. This this is why God judges nations, even if they don't have Bibles to read, even if they've never heard the name of Jesus. You need to understand this is a very important question. Why can God judge a nation if that nation has never even heard the gospel? Well, listen to Psalm 9. The nations have fallen into the pit they dug for others. Their own feet have been caught in the trap they set. The Lord is known for his justice. The wicked are trapped by their own deeds. The wicked will go down to the grave. This is the fate of all the nations who ignore God. But the needy will not be ignored forever. The hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. Arise, O Lord. Do not let mere mortals defy you. Judge the nations. So I want you to write this down. This is important. God charges all people to treat others like they want to be treated. Doesn't that sound simple? All people. The image of God is still reflected in fallen man through his conscience that even without a bible even without special revelation man contains an inner sense of basic moral responsibility evidence mind you that he did not evolve from a slimy pond there is even in every man fallen man as he may be that he should treat people like he wants to be treated by people Paul refers to this in the second chapter of Romans in verse 15. He says they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing wrong. They might be able to take the Ten Commandments from the courtroom, but you can never remove it from the conscience. God holds men accountable for knowing better than they do. For doing to others what they would hate for anyone to do to them. This is how God is just and fair in condemning nations. Nations where the Bible has never been printed. Nations where the gospel has never been preached. 
You wouldn't want someone to come and pillage your village or rape your daughters or assault your wife or slander your name or kidnap your children or lie about your character. But in the name of national defense or or a philosophy that says, yeah, you know, all's fair in war. We would somehow think it's okay to do that to others. On this basis alone, God says, I have the right to judge all men and find them guilty. You consistently do to other people what deep in your heart you know you would never want anyone to do to you for your own self-absorbed agenda. That's one of the reasons, by the way, that pornography is so wicked. Aside from the fact that it promotes perversion and immorality, what dad holds his precious little baby girl in his hands when she is born and says, my dream for this little girl is that someday some man's going to ask her to take off her clothes so that he can give her money to do that so that other men can ogle at her. What father says that's his dream for his little girl? And I got to tell you, listen, if if God blesses me to have granddaughters someday and if somebody ever approached my granddaughter and she's in some kind of a bad situation and uh, and she needs money and and they try to take advantage of her and say, hey, we'll give you some money. Just all you got to do is take off your clothes. Let us take a few pictures. The only thing I want to tell you is I have a concealed carry permit that was issued to me by the state of Iowa. Let's leave it at that. And listen, men, you would go online and you would stare at some other man's baby girl. You will do to another girl what you would never in the world let happen to your own daughter. This is what God says to the nations. This is, this is why I have never bought the argument that says, well, we shouldn't go into these countries, you know, because, because if they hear about Jesus, then they'll know then, and they'll be held responsible, and then, and then they'll be condemned if they reject it. They're already condemned. Men think that they can say when the universal standard of, of right and wrong printed on the conscience is applied to them. But God is going to actually be the one that has the last word. Now that is the message of these first six sermons that Amos is preaching about all the nations that are surrounding Israel. And you know Amos is getting a lot of hearty amens, brother. Preach it, brother. But then Amos moves from preaching to meddling. Now remember, he's from the south. He's from the southern kingdom. He's from Judah. And he's up in the north preaching to the northern kingdom. And this next sermon is about Judah. So look what he says in Amos chapter 2 verses 4 through 5. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees. Because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire upon Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. And I bet that some people that were listening in the crowd were thinking, this is my favorite sermon. Here they are in the north and he's talking about the south and they hate those people in the south. But I guarantee you there were some old timers that were listening. And they knew what Amos was doing. In his sermon, you see, he's beginning to tighten the noose around Israel's neck. Because notice that God says to Judah, I don't just condemn you for violating that basic sense of right and wrong in your conscience, but you had direct special revelation. You had the word of the Lord. You had the law of God. That same law that Israel has. Amos is a brilliant preacher because have you ever noticed that one of the best ways to get someone to examine themselves is to point out the same faults in somebody else? 
Remember, Nathan did that with David. He tells David this story about this, this poor man that had one little lamb that he thought was so precious. He loved that lamb like it was one of his own children. They would literally eat around the table and the lamb would be there at the table with them. And his rich neighbor who had hundreds of lambs of his own had some company that came and he didn't want to slaughter one of his own lambs. So he went to the poor man, took his lamb that he loved so much, slaughtered it and fed it to his company. And David just was incensed and he burned with anger. And he's saying, what kind of man who has a whole bunch of something would take another man's one treasured possession? And Nathan says, David. You are the man. You remember what Paul does in the first three chapters of Romans. He, he starts in Romans 1. He talks about all the wicked sins of the Gentiles. But you get over to chapter 2 and he says, Do you Jews think that you're any better? They violate their conscience. But you do the very same thing by violating the very word of God. For seven sermons, Amos has said, God hates injustice. God hates when people take advantage of the poor or the weak. God hates when people ignore his word. And then he preaches his eighth sermon. And the title of this sermon was, Look in the Mirror. These are the words that he preaches to the northern kingdom, beginning in verse 6. It says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver, the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. I destroyed the Amorite before them, though he was tall as the cedar and strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and I led you 40 years in the desert to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength. And the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. And the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. You see, Israel wanted God to execute justice on her enemies. And yet Israel was equally guilty of condoning injustice inside her own borders. She was more guilty than all of those surrounding kingdoms because she sinned against unprecedented privilege. Israel despised the grace of God. You see, if God expects all people to treat others like they want to be treated, then God expects His people to treat others like they have been treated. That's what God says to Israel. They were guilty because they didn't treat others like they wanted to be treated. But Israel was even more guilty because they didn't treat people like God had already treated them. I want you to consider God's goodness to Israel. He said, well, first off, I brought you up out of Egypt. I gave you the land that belonged to the Amorites. And then I gave you my laws to guide you. A fundamental principle that's woven all through the, all through the law is this priority of compassion to others. God gave them prophets to teach them the word of the Lord, to direct them in right living. He gave them Nazarites who were young men who took vows to show what godly living looks like. And what did they do? 
They ignored his law. They crushed the poor. They persecuted the prophets. They mocked these young godly men. God had given grace upon grace upon grace. And they did not give that grace to anyone. You know what the Lord thinks about that? You read in the book of Matthew chapter 18. Jesus tells the story about this, this man who was a debtor. And he owed the king more than he could pay back in a thousand lifetimes. And the king, in pity, had mercy on him and he forgave his entire debt. And as he was leaving the king's presence, he came out and on the street, he runs into a man that owed him a few weeks wages. And the man that owed him that money fell on his knees before him and said, have mercy on me. And that former debtor threw that man in prison. And you need to pay attention in the Bible when, when it says something really infuriates God. And it infuriated God when people who have received unprecedented grace refuse to treat others like they have already been treated. God's first word is always grace. And if men disgrace his first word... God will have the last word. So Amos saw a nation on its last legs. We, we saw last week that the nation, they didn't even see it. They thought that things were going really well. Things could never be better in our nation right now. I mean, our borders are expanded. Our profit margins are huge. Our worship shrines are full of people. The nation would say, things have never been better. But Amos came and said, I see a nation in serious trouble because God has said to you, four is enough. Now, I said last week, I want you to understand that Amos is not the main character in Amos. God is. And the reason the church needs to reread and study the message of Amos as hard and gloomy as it can be, is because there are some things about God that we tend to forget or dismiss or minimize if we don't. So let me share with you two things about God that we learned from Amos's sermons that he preached that we must not forget. Number one, God is absolutely sovereign. Amos makes two very bold declarations about God. Number one, he is not unaware of the injustice that goes on in the world. There is not a single king, there's not a single dictator, there's not a single country in the world that is treating its people wrong that has escaped the notice of God. Secondly, God is the Lord of all nations, whether they recognize him or not. It doesn't matter what gods they worship. It doesn't matter if they outlaw the worship of the one true God. He is still the Lord of that nation. You see, Amos doesn't speak for a tribal deity. He speaks for the Lord of all. In fact, it's interesting. You'll never see Amos call God the God of Israel. Not one time in his book. He is not the God of Israel. He's the God of the whole earth. And he's saying that the future of nations does not depend on their economies or their domestic policies or their politics. It depends, hear this clearly, on their moral choices. Now that is never what the historians will say. The historians will tell you that it was the Assyrians or it was the Babylonians that destroyed the eight nations that Amos preached against. But Amos wants you to understand God is behind that. Historians write their books, but God has always the last word. That's because he's absolutely sovereign. And secondly, God is resolutely just. That, that phrase, for three sins, even for four, it sounds very harsh. 
But it's actually a tribute to the amazing patience of God. You cannot accuse God of rushing to judgment. God never punishes except after prolonged observation and ample opportunity for repentance. Even after all these sermons Amos preached, Israel had 40 more years to repent. The southern kingdom had 150 more years before judgment came. But judgment did come. What I'm about to explain next is impossible, I think, for human minds to understand. But from our perspective, there comes a time when God's patience runs out. And again, I I realize that's hard to accept because God is infinite. And that means that all of his attributes are infinite. To say that God has like limited patience. No, God has complete inexhaustive patience. But from a human perspective, there's a time when God's patience runs out. In other words, there exists in God's nature a perfect blending of patience and judgment, love and justice, grace and wrath. And if God's first word of grace is treated disgracefully, his last word will be justice. God could not be true to himself and his moral standard if it were not true. So God is patience, but his patience is not an appeal to ignore sin. It is an appeal to deal with sin. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, the first four verses, you may think you condemn such people, but you're just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? God is resolutely Just and he cannot be anything less than who he is. The holy God will make things right. He will have the last word, which kind of brings me to ask you a question that I want you to really ponder. If God is the Lord of all the earth, if if he is the Lord of all nations, if the future of a nation does not depend on its form of government. What will America's fourth sin be? John Adams in 1798 wrote these words that I think are still profound. We have no government armed with power of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. God judges nations on the basis of whether right and wrong matter. On the basis of whether they will treat people like they want to be treated. And when I ponder America's current situation... I see that right and wrong no longer matter. In fact, questions of right and wrong are not even allowed in the public discourse. And our nation treats its most fragile, its most weak, its most vulnerable, the unborn, the infirm, the elderly, as disposable commodities that cannot be allowed to inconvenience our quest for more material possessions. I would like, as we close out this message this morning, for for us to spend some time for our nation in prayer. We have a responsibility to pray for our nation, for our nation's leaders. And I'm not talking about wrapping the cross and the American flag. I am not an American Christian. 
I'm a Christian who happens to live in America. I'm, I'm blessed to live here, but I know very clearly where my first allegiance lies. But our nation needs prayer. We need to pray about whether or not we will be a nation who cares about the poor. Whether or not we care about life inside and outside the womb. Whether or not we want people of all colors to have a fair shot at a decent life. Whether or not our leaders care about what is right and wrong. I want my nation's leaders to be those kind of people. And that's what I want us to spend some time praying. So what I'm going to ask is, and we don't normally do this kind of a thing, but if you're able and if you're not, don't do it. Just stay seated. But the Bible says that when you, when you pray for nations, you need to humble yourself. So God does not bless proud nations. What I want us to do is I want us to get on our knees right now, if you can. And I'm going to play a video. And while the video is playing, I want you to just be praying for America. And then while we're still on our knees, we're going to sing a song together and close out our worship service.